we think of biodiversity, most of us probably think of creatures that generally resemble us. But the invertebrates, insects, sea urchins, worms, weevils, and the like, constitute 97% of all animal species. One person who cares deeply about invertebrates is Robert Michael Pyle, the founder of the Xerces Society, which is dedicated to the conservation of invertebrate life. Pyle is a lepidopterist, an expert on butterflies, but he's also a popular writer with numerous books to his credit. And he's a poet. This poem is published in the book Chinook and Chanterelle from Lost Horse Press. It's called Unwanted Creatures. Like tigers in the grasses of the Bay of Bengal, having villagers for lunch. Like bats that flap into bedrooms, leaving rumors of rabies and garlic. Like wolves who snap up afterbirths, and sometimes even calves. Like caterpillars of cabbage whites, turning broccoli into lace. Like bison blamed for bovine TB, and beavers for giardia like goats in the Galapagos, and elephants in Maasai crops. The flicker hammering the roof at dawn, the mockingbird chattering the night away, the owl who calls your name at night, that raven on the bust of Pallas who makes it all too clear, Lenore ain't coming back. Like starlings in the city park, spotted owls in old growth woods, crows in the cornrows, even that nightingale in Barclay Square must have pissed somebody off. Like ants in the pantry, bats in the belfry, bees in the bonnet, bulls in the china shop, fleas on the kitty, ticks on the pooch, squirrels in the attic, rats in the roof, slugs in the lettuce, crabs in the crotch, pumas in the playground, coyotes in the lambing fold, and snakes and spiders pretty much everywhere. Like prairie dogs digging up the open range, Raccoons ransacking the trash. Sea lions with a taste for salmon. Rabbits at the carrot patch. Bears at a picnic. Chiggers in the grass. Possums on the road. Deer through the windshield. Skunks on the auto grill. Mosquitoes at the barbecue. Clothes moths in your woolen socks. Midges on the Scottish heath. Black flies blotting out the midnight sun. Maggots in the Granny Smith. Roaches on the kitchen floor, lice in your daughter's hair, tapeworms in the gut, virus in the blood, like Jews on Kristallnacht, Palestinians on the Temple Mount, blacks on the schoolhouse steps, Indians in Dodge, Tutsis with the Hutus, Muslims with the Serbs, Catholics in Ulster, gays in Laramie, women to the Taliban, everyone to someone else unwanted, unwanted all. Be sure and keep the doors closed. I love it. It's a lovely poem. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I asked you to do that because it occurs to me that you've spent a lot of your life with creatures who maybe aren't unwanted. And I'm thinking of the butterflies, for example. But they're not creatures that other people have set out to conserve. That's absolutely right. And that started, from my understanding, with an encounter in Crested Butte, Colorado, when you were very young. Can we start with that encounter? Because that really shaped your life, didn't it? Absolutely shaped my life in every way. Yes, I was um, living at the time. In fact, I lived all through my school years in Aurora, Colorado, a big suburb of Denver. At that time, a small town when we moved there uh, in 52. But by the time I left there for college in 65, it was large and now it's the tail wagging the dog actually more populous than Denver. So the growth of the suburbs in this exoskeleton around Denver was immense and I, I lived through that during my school years. Um, it was not an unpleasant place to be in most respects but it was uh, a classic post-war subdivision and um, <clears throat> so I relished every chance to get out into the countryside because I, I had a passion for nature at a very young age. It first expressed itself with mollusks, with seashells, which was a silly thing to do in Colorado. Bad place to be a kid conchologist in Colorado. But finally, at the age of 11, uh, my stepbrother, my parents had, had uh, broken up very, very early uh, when I was nine, and uh, my father remarried, and I acquired a stepbrother named Bruce Campbell, who said one day, I'm going out to catch insects for a merit badge. He was doing scouts for a while. 
do you want to come? And I was just about that time saying, the heck with these seashells. I'm going to do something that would, gives me a little more recorded love here. I said, yeah, I'll go along. I'll, I'll do the butterflies. I was a bit interested in butterflies. I'd seen a few flitting and thought, mm, those are cool. So I went and Bruce quit the next day. He didn't really care for entomology, but that was the beginning for me. Now that was the summer I turned 11, in 58. But the next summer, um, the family, the recombined family, went to Crested Butte, Colorado, as it did for each summer after that part of the summer, because my stepmother and her family had a cabin there. They were primarily Oklahoma people and Kansas people and Texas people. And a lot of folks from those states came to the Rockies in the summertime. Uh, but that was before the Colorado towns were swish and fancy and, and chic and, and expensive, except for Aspen was the only one then. So Crested Butte was a crusty, dusty old Slavic coal town, and the cabins were cheap. So people would come and have these summer cabins, mostly from, from the near south. And <clears throat> I hankered for any chance to get into the mountains because I lived on the wrong side of Denver for the mountains. I was a prairie kid. If you live on the west side of Denver, you're a kid of the Rocky Mountains. You live on the east side, you're a kid of the Great Plains. And that was me, and I liked my prairie ditch and so on. But the mountains, that's where the butterflies were. So. Uh, my father would go on occasional fishing trips, but they were just day trips. So to go up to Crested Butte in the, in the West Elk Mountains, that first time in the summer of 1959, when I turned 12 years old, was absolute magic. Butterflies all around me. Well, I had been reading <clears throat> in uh, F. Martin Brown's book, Colorado Butterflies, that my father had given me, in the Denver Museum of Natural History all about these butterflies, and I was particularly intrigued by a, a black species, all black, called the Magdalena alpine. And it lived in the high rock slides, and it mentioned uh, a location up, uh, up some distance above Crested Butte, and I always wondered if I might be able to get up there, a place called Copper, Copper Creek. Well, it was a little too far from the village for me to get up there. My father, however, would fish up the meanders of the East River uh, going up out of Crested Butte toward a place called Gothic. Uh, in those days, he just had to talk to the rancher to fish in those beautiful serpentine loops of the river. Now it's all a, a syndicate, and you pay $10,000 for a fishing fee for the year, that sort of thing. We went up there, and I would fish with him at first, but he did me the great favor of never teaching me fly fishing, because if he had, my life might have come out very, very different. I'd be maybe plowing the same turf as David James Duncan, but I never learned fly fishing, and I was bored with bait fishing. So I'd throw my spinner out a couple of times, and then when I didn't catch anything, I'd hope my dad wasn't watching, and I'd put it down, and I'd grab my butterfly net and go off into the meadows. That was my passion. And I think it was fine with him, really. I, I just think that uh, bringing in the direct experience of daily encounter, that's one reason I live where I do. It's a rural area, it's not the wilderness, but I can walk outside my door and there are other organisms all the time. From the birds to the snails to the plants. And there's surprise out of doors every single day I go out. And you know, I could be, as some poets are, writing a poem every single day about what's happening. Uh, a few too many, nobody's going to listen to them all or read them all. <laughs> I try to, it's like my activism. I try to pick my battles and choose ones that, where I can make a difference uh, or I hope I can make a contribution. Same with the poem. I don't write every poem I feel like writing or every essay or every story. I'll wait until I feel like there's really a reason for doing this one. It kind of has to be done. And it's good for my health, and I think it's going to keep me from wearing out sooner. <laughs> Robert Michael Pyle, scientist, author, poet. There's something very special about people like Bob Pyle who really immerse themselves in the natural world and then help the rest of us to understand it and value it properly. We've done some other interviews like that, with Bridget Stutchbury, for example, an expert on songbirds whose work underlies the recent film called The Messenger. And we've had a couple of guests, Gary Saunders and Diana Beresford Kroger, who have shared fascinating perspectives on the private life of trees. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. Thanks for watching.